Okay, so well done. You've made it through four days of COP, or you've got to day four of COP. I, I must admit that I feel rather like it feels like we've been going for about four weeks, really. And one of the exciting reasons for that is that there's so much media interest. My name's Natalie Bennett. I'm one of the Green Party members of the House of Lords in the UK. Um, and I've never seen a COP like it. Uh, I do have to share with you, um, the British members of the audience will appreciate this particularly. I did an interview on Monday with Jeremy Kyle, who for those who are not British is a rather infamous, um, used to have a rather infamous television show that was very, very shock jockey, I, I guess for shorthand. And they said, will you come on to Jeremy Kyle on talk radio to talk about COP? And I sort of went, not entirely sure about that. And we actually had a wonderful eight minute conversation, very sensible, quite deep, quite serious. And they posted the whole thing on Twitter afterwards. So I feel like that's a, a real mark of the world changing, really. And of course, what we've been focusing very much on is the need for the world to change. And we've heard lots of positive announcements. Most people I'm hearing are saying COP has been more positive thus far than we expected. But our subject of today is reshaping the global economy. And the practical reality is, of course, we are a very long way from getting anywhere we need, where we need to do on doing that. And this afternoon, I was at the, uh, the Peatland Pavilion because my first degree is agricultural science, so I can get really geeky about soils. But uh, I won't be doing that today. But um, they were talking about blending public and private finance uh, for preserving peatland. And it was interesting because the word complexity basically appeared in every sentence. And I sat there thinking, you know, it's a little bit like a casino, really. In a casino, the house always wins. And as soon as you make something a complex financial instrument, somehow or other, I think the financial sector always wins, not whatever that might be putatively directed at. Mm. So that's a small whiz through my three amazing, four amazing days of COP. Um, but it's not about me. I'm just here to keep things flowing along. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is turn to Peter Sims from the Greenhouse Think Tank. And Peter's going to give us a little introduction to Greenhouse and indeed the Green European Foundation that's also supporting this. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Natalie. Just to give a very brief introduction to the project, this event is being organised as part of the Climate and Emergency Economy Project. Uh, and that is a transnational project run by the Green European Foundation, Greenhouse Think Tank, uh, which is the organisation I'm part of, is the UK partner. Uh, and the focus of this is how we need to reshape our economy to make, to realise the regard and looking at what those economic interventions are. Um, so the project has uh, transnational partners from multiple countries. So in the UK, we've been working on transport investment this year. Uh, the Netherlands have been working on uh, hydrogen in the climate economy. We've also had partners in Ireland and Poland working on what food sovereignty and regional resilience looks like in the climate emergency economy. Um, uh, just to flag some of our recent publications, if you're interested, you can go uh, collect them from the stall at the end, but they're also all available on our website to download for free. Uh, we also have various other resources uh, looking at a breakdown of UK trade and a uh, toolkit, which I'll come on to later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter, and I'll particularly recommend the trade one for some very interesting work on steel that I, I uh, cite regularly. Now, our first speaker is going to be joining us remotely. Uh, Jonathan Glennie is a very well-known figure in these fields. He's from the Overseas Development Institute and will be speaking on global public investment. So over to you, Jonathan. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's such an honour to be here. Um, I don't work for the Overseas uh, Development Institute. Oh. I used to. I left in about oh, quite a long time ago now, but uh, I'm now an independent consultant working with a number of different organizations, including Equal International. And um, it was actually at the Overseas Development Institute back in the day that I did, you know, probably the last time I worked heavily on climate finance. And it, I, I've just started to look at it again uh, because I've been, I, I work on development finance, let's call it broadly speaking, international public finance and private finance, um, not specifically the world of climate, but in the last few months, I've been looking at the climate world in much more detail 
uh, partly because I've been working with Salim Il Hook at uh, ICAD and uh, people at E3G um, on a round table that I think some of you may have been at uh, a couple of weeks ago where we talked about um, what's going, I was going to say right and wrong with climate finance, but there's hardly anything going right. So it's pretty much what's going wrong with climate finance and, and how a new approach uh, might, be, might be plausible. And that's what I'm going to talk about a bit today as well. Um, one of the things that um, I remember talking with Salim Al Hook, you know, literally 10 years ago about was that the climate finance pledge, it can't, maybe it wasn't exactly 10 years, I don't know, but whenever the pledge came out, was deliberately ambiguous with regard to whether the 100 billion was private or public. I mean, you know, it's such, I, I, I couldn't believe it when I started looking at this again. And I think, I think it was in a previous meeting that you were chairing, Natalie, that I met you guys, and then we were presented with some of the numbers on the climate finance. And I looked at the Oxfam report. Uh, it was an Oxfam report, I think, last year, looking at climate finance from 2017. We haven't reached 100 billion. We know that. It was like 80 billion. But what was the 80 billion? The 80 billion was 40% of it was unconcessional, non, what we call non-concessional loans. So lending at a market rate, money that has to be paid back at a market rate. Another 40% was concessional loans. So... So money that had to be paid back, but less, less but cheaper than the market. And then 20% was grants, money that doesn't have to be, re to, to be paid back. So let me just make that clear. If Oxfam's numbers are right, and I don't know enough about this to verify them, 80% of the quotes climate finance, so a tiddly number of 100 billion, as we know, and it wasn't even that, it was 80 billion, 80% 80 of 80 billion had to be paid back. And half of that had to be paid back at market rate. Only 20% was, was, was grants. And the concessional stuff, if, you, if you're good at maths, you worked out that 60% of that is concessional. So concessional loans plus grants, that's ODA anyway. Yeah, that is not additional. ODA has stagnated over the last few years. Uh, and in the UK, as we know, it's, 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 it's just being reduced. So, so I, I hesitate to use this word, but as Natalie is an agricultural economist, it's total bullshit. I mean, I was blown away. I was blown away about, I knew it was kind of bullshit, but it's total bullshit. Okay, so, 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 and I know it's kind of a big thing. And I think one of the things we have to ask as we look at, you know, how we have to shift the, the global economy and national economies in, in this climate emergency is why, why is that 100 billion or that climate finance promise considered so important? It's quite a small amount of money. OK, and we know that there's other, other financing and other e economic shifts that are required that are far, far more important than a transfer of money from north to south, effectively, from, from polluters to non-polluters, from rich to poor, or however one puts it. Um, I mean, and yet it is important. And I think that's for two reasons. Um, firstly, it's, the, it's, it's a promise made. And the level of trust, as I understand it, at these negotiations is rock bottom. And that's one of the reasons. Yeah, they made a promise 10 years ago. They, people, people will say, oh, we delivered 80 billion. They haven't. Okay, they've delivered total nonsense on, on that. And we haven't even gone into the detail of how it's spent and all that stuff, which, which, which probably some of you know already. So, so there's, the, there's the failure to deliver on a promise that makes all future promises less valid. And that's a big deal at international negotiations. But I think it's also because actually, you know, public money is important. And... And we are being, you know, the last few decades, certainly most of my professional life, we've lived within the straitjacket of what some people would call neoliberal understanding of the economy. You might just call it a classical liberal understanding of the economy, whatever. But it's a, it's a heavy focus on uh, the private sector, a reduction in the role of the state, et cetera. And, and we are emerging from that. OK, it's quite clear to me that actually, you know, in, this, in, the, in the middle of what is a hugely complex global situation, not just on climate, but just with regard to, um, yeah, let's call it geopolitics and international relations. I think the really positive thing is we're emerging from the neoliberal straitjacket, quite clearly. I mean, no one believes that anymore. Um, there are elements of it which are worth hanging on to, macroeconomic stability, um, uh, some level of management of inflation, and those kind of things. I mean, it's not total nonsense, but it was a huge straitjacket. It was ideological, that it was, it was not necessary. And the re-emergence of the public in our theoretical analysis, whether that becomes genuine global policy is another matter, but in our theoretical analysis is an important step forward. And the, 
the, you know, what, what climate finance needs to be, in my view, is tons more money, public money. That means money that is raised through uh, the exchequer or through transnational taxation, those kind of things. I mean, private money is great. Okay, it's wonderful, and we need that. But it's be, but the, the, but but the arrival, but the argument, you know, there's tons more private money. Let's let's just forget about the public. Is false. It's a sleight of hand. It's not true to say that public money doesn't matter just because there's much more private money. Okay, that's a total. Uh, it, 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 uh, what's the word? Fallacy. It's a fallacy. So just because something small doesn't make it unimportant, as I've been told <laughs> regularly, I shouldn't have said that. Sorry, but just um, you know, it, it, you know, a small amount of money can be crucial. To, to, to progress. So for instance, at the national level, what no one would ever say, oh, well, we just need tons of money for health. It doesn't matter if it's private, it doesn't matter if it's public, it doesn't matter if it's you know, charity, it just, we just need money. Yeah, that's basically what the climate finance pledge said, we just need money. But actually it does matter hugely if the money is private or foundations or public. And so we need to reaffirm the unique importance of public money, not just at the national level, but at the international level, which is tiny, okay? So at the moment it's like, you know, it's, 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 it's 0.2 or 3% of the global economy, but it can be uh, crucial in catalyzing progress. And so the, the, the project that I'm working on at the moment, and that another Jonathan who'll be speaking later has picked up on a bit, is this idea of global public investment. So we know we need tons more money, but we can't have it governed by the ODA system, because the ODA system is emerging basically from the 50s and 60s. It's, a, it's an outdated post-colonial um, approach to transferring money from uh, richer countries to poorer countries. The government- Let's pick up that acronym, Jonathan, ODA, Overseas Development Assistance. Yeah, yeah, actually it's official. To, it's, it actually it stands for official development assistance, but, but it is what you just said. It's, um, it's overseas spending and it is the 0.7% thing, yeah? And climate finance, really interestingly, has charted a different path. It hasn't worked uh, very well, but, it's, but the narrative is very different. And the ODA system, the aid system, talks about charity to help those that are you know, needy of our largesse. The climate finance language is much more of investment in our common world, responsibilities being paid for by the by the polluters so actually it's much more progressive language but the reality is very different and the governance remains very very top heavy as i think everyone knows so what we need is tons more money but governed in a very different way and a very different narrative because without a different narrative to tell the public both in the wealthy northern countries, but also in, 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 in all countries, without a different narrative, we're not gonna to get to the right policy. Okay, with the narrative of aid, Rishi Sunak can turn up at the par parliament and said, well, you know, we would love to give more charity to these countries, but we're in trouble. So we, we have to reduce the charity that we're offering. That's the aid narrative. And it allows Rishi Sunak to do that. When we're talking about global public investment, we're talking about investment in our common global home. We're talking about the urgent requirement to invest in things that matter to us. So it's absurd for Rishi Sunak to go to Parliament and say he's reducing climate finance or, or more broadly sustainable development finance because he's damaging his own country. But because we've let the narrative uh, 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 be, be uh, I guess, a classic paternalistic charity narrative, um, uh, that, that, that is much harder for us to win the policy war. So the narrative matters. The governance uh, uh, also matters, but fundamentally, I think we need to be bolder and 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 kind of ride this moment. It feels really quite negative, and you never know how things are going to go. You know, I've basically made the wrong predictions about pretty much most political uh, moments for the last fifteen years. I didn't believe Trump would ever win. That's crazy. I thought that the impact of the two thousand and eight two thousand and nine crash was going to be. Uh, better uh, regulation of the banks. I, 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 that's total, totally obviously not happened. And we've actually had a move to the kind of, I guess, economic right on that and populism. Um, so, so you don't know how the world is going to turn out. And we're definitely living in this difficult time. Uh, but as a campaigner, the good news is you still just, you know, campaign for what you know is necessary. 
and we need much more internationalism, much more multinationalism. And, um, and to reaffirm, I think that what, what we haven't been affirming enough, which is a huge amount of international public money to support our international public objective, not private money and not enough domestic money because the domestic money is just not enough to rely, to ask poorer countries to rely on their own income is totally unfair. So we need tons more international public money. It sounds crazy because we've allowed the politics to, let's say, reduce the Overton window, this kind of the, the, the political possibilities. But there is actually a growing movement for this. And I think that assuming that this COP is not particularly successful, and it's interesting that Natalie says it's looking more, more successful than, than it might have been. Well, I mean, you know, talk about expectation management. Uh, it's like expectations were so low. I expect it probably will come out with a few things that look a bit better. But overall, we know it's not probably going to make that much progress. I'm, I'd love to be proved wrong. In that context, there's going to be even more fervor next year, especially from the southern governments and southern civil society, that this can't keep, keep on. And I haven't mentioned COVID, but that has also changed the game. I know I've got to stop now, and I don't want to take other people's time. I'd be delighted to come back and kind of answer any questions later. But, but yeah, COVID has changed the game because there is anger, deep, deep anger about the way that global finances are managed. And um, that anger will turn into, I hope, uh, some kind of progressive movement for, for significant structural change, not just throwing more money at the problem. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for that powerful and very clear presentation. And I think we can all uh, thank the late, date, great uh, David Graeber for making bullshit an official term that we're allowed to use um, is in a technical way, which we've just done. Uh, and I think, in terms of expectation management of COP, I think it partly comes from uh, British people's expectation of their government is partly where the low expectations for COP may have started. And I should perhaps define for anyone international in the audience who doesn't know that reference to 0.7 and 0.5 is the British government and the Conservative um, government in their manifesto in the last election said they would keep ODA at 0.7% of GNP um, and they've cut it to 0.5 at a point when the GNP has also gone down significantly. So British overseas aid has gone down very significantly. So that's just the background for anyone international who may not know that. Uh, I think we've got a great recipe there for what to do with climate, for climate finance. Um, our next speaker, Jonathan Essex, is from the Greenhouse Think Tank, and I'm sure we're going to hear lots more positive perspectives on what we can and should do to make the global economy work for the future. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Although I'm, I'm afraid it's going to be less, less than positive, I think it's first important that we're open and honest about where we are now and what actually needs to be done. So I'm going to touch a little bit on, on climate finance, picking up on, on much of what Jonathan has said, and, and then talk about some research we've done on, on what aid is currently spent on and the direction of, of, of a development globally and, and here in the UK. And hopefully that will open up some opportunities for debate. So, so firstly, climate finance. I think it's worth noting that in 2009, it was 100 billion. Um, in, that was the commitment. Uh, the latest year of figures is 2018. Uh, the provision is 79 billion, of which 49, 44 billion, according to uh, a research by, the, by, by a US think tank earlier this year, just 44 is in any way can be classified as additional. So the, the talk at COP is that we're close to 100. Um, even if you consider um, uh, debt creating loans as being something that should be included. Um, the fact that it's, it, we, we're nowhere near, we're absolutely nowhere near. Um, secondly, I think it's worth pointing out that 100 billion agreed 11 years ago, surely there's a thing called inflation. So should we not index that agreement to something like GNI in exactly the same way as ODA is, uh, official development assistance, so that as countries get richer, our commitment to give money to those around the world who are being held back in their development by, by climate and the impacts of climate should, should get the, the, the same share. Um, thirdly, I would say, well, how much money should it be and why 100 billion? It would seem that 100 billion was a number plucked out of thin air, so to speak, in the, the conference in 2009 to secure an agreement. It wasn't based on the amount of money that needs to be spent. 
If, if you look at research on, on climate adaptation by the UN and on climate mitigation spending or, or clean energy investment by uh, research by the IPCC, together that comes to around four trillion pounds a year. If you consider how much of that might be investment in countries that require uh, assistance internationally, maybe half of that, two trillion. But on top of that, I think it's worth considering the 5.9 trillion of underpricing of fossil fuels globally at the moment, which accounts to 6.8% of global uh, gross domestic product. Uh, 450 uh, billion pounds in direct fossil fuel subsidies, and the rest of it is, is effectively the, the failure to account for the environmental costs and the wider social costs of burning those fossil fuels. So we really do need to do what people have been saying at COP is shifting from the billions to the trillions. But I think it's very important that that shift occurs, as Jonathan has set out, uh, in a shift of the amount of grant and concessional finance that's provided through public finance, rather than relying on somehow the, the private sector to give us some notional get out of jail free card so that the governments of the world, the governments of the uh, most polluting countries of the world don't sign up to and provide what, what is, is their duty. Now, I, I was passed a piece of paper by Peter um, this morning from, from a, a a report done by um, developed, sorry, developing nations at COP, and which looks at the historic uh, climate emissions. Uh, and what that said was over one third of the developing nations' emissions, historic emissions, have occurred since Rio, since the start of this process of agreeing, agreeing what should we do on climate change. So when you think of historic emissions, it isn't just all the way back to industrialization, it's the continued propensity for particularly rich countries around the world to emit carbon once we've agreed we're going to do something about it. And that growing gap between the emissions of rich countries and the emissions which, which the scientists say that we should be emitting has been evident since the process of Conference of Parties or United Nations Framework on Convention of Climate Change meetings have been taking place. And that report, which I was shared with, said that you know, if we were as, as rich countries to, to stay within our fair share of reaching net zero, then the UK would have to be zero carbon by 2035, the whole of the EU by 2031, US and Canada by 2025, and Australia by 2024. But when I visited the COP blue zone, and the politicians wandering around and looked at the, the Australia um, pavilion, um, I passed a uh, a session on um, carbon uh, uh, offsetting in the Indo-Pacific region. When I visited uh, the, the, the Qatar um, pavilion, there was a, uh, a guy bouncing a football talking about climate change, promoting the FIFA World Cup and their hosting of the Olympics. But it didn't seem to be coming to the table to have a serious discussion about responsibilities and change. The second thing I think was touched on by Jonathan was the question of additionality. You know, ODA was agreed in 1969. Climate change is a, an extra problem, which, we, which we've come across since then. Since then, inequality around the world has increased, but climate change is a new problem which requires additional money. Um, if the world was to provide the level of ODA, official development assistance, 0.7% as agreed a lot of years ago, it would be providing an extra 193 billion pounds a year. I say that because the talk at COP is providing an extra 100 billion. It seems convenient for the rich countries to talk about providing an extra 100 when over 50 years ago, that 50 year commitment would require them to provide at least another 200 anyway. So my maths is 193 plus 100 equals 300 just for starters. So the 100 and raising ambition, I, I, I heard um, the, the US uh, um, uh, delegate, is it Kerry? Okay. John, John Kerry talking yesterday and saying, oh, I think we've got it up to over 100 for two years time. It's, it's frankly, frankly not good enough and it's in the wrong, wrong ballpark. But put all that to one side, you know, this proposed, this sits, supposes that everything we're doing apart from climate finance, aligns to dealing with the climate emergency. 
Well, frankly, that's not the case. So research we've done for Greenhouse looked at dirty investment. We could have looked at fossil fuel investment, but there's plenty of people who have already looked at continued investment in fossil fuels around the world. So we focused on transport. And the reason we did is because transport accounts for 20% of all the allocated aid spending uh, currently in the last five years. And the UK and EU alone, that accounts for 5 billion euros a year. Transport is the fastest growing emitter of climate change globally, and it, current projections say that they will reach 18 gigatons of CO2 a year by 2050. And the biggest increases percentage-wise are in developing countries in Africa and Asia. Why is that? It's because we're encouraging, we're incentivizing countries to grow in the image of the UK, EU, America now, rather than on what the IPC described in their landmark report in 2018 to follow climate resilient development pathways. That was a report which said, how can we stay within in the challenge of 1.5 degrees? It was the report that spawned the idea of a climate emergency. And it was also a report that said we need to stay within the 1.5 degrees and deliver the sustainable development goals at the same time. We need to do it in an equitable manner. We need to transform what we think development is. But the UK and EU are continuing to spend money on developing uh, economies around the world in a way that doesn't deal with climate change, it expands trade. It's, uh, I think, um, let me say, the European Bank for Reconstruction Development, um, the European Investment Bank, uh, their policies um, reflect the ability of Western countries to continue the worship of an ancient Roman god called Janus. It's the ability to face in two directions at the same time. So on roads, the um, European Bank for Reconstruction Development says that the vast majority of economies where the bank invests have significant gaps in road connectivity, cross-border and global network connectivity remains a priority with significant investment gaps remaining. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Aviation. Support for low-cost and regional airlines, entry and expansion to improve air connectivity, dot, 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 whilst aviation is recognised as one of the fastest growing emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. Can you see a conflict there? Can you see a problem? So the, the top 10 EBRB pro, EBRD projects, which are currently investing around the world, include a 217 km, kilometer stretch on road, financed to airports, financed to ports, alongside significant rail electrification. UK export finance states that it's reducing its global uh, portfolio of greenhouse gas emissions. But strangely, while the Danish claim to have the cleanest export finance in the world ever at their pavilion at COP. The UK seems to be slightly silent on theirs. And perhaps that's because they're investing in airport expansion around the world. Um, they're investing in uh, one billion pounds of export finance to export um, liquid, liquefied petroleum gas from Mozambique and so on. For example, let me read you this. Tamales Airport's new terminal is intended to facilitate the export of fresh agricultural products by air, such as shea butter, cashew nuts and mangoes. Well, that's exactly the kind of development we don't need if we're dealing with climate change. The UK funds currently over half a billion pounds of transport sector projects, um, which talk about expanding trade as the rationale for investment. The largest current UK aid in million pounds. So, so we're really saying that we need to get beyond the climate finance and say that all the finance, all of o ODA and climate finance that's provided um, transnationally must stop financing things that lock in fossil fuel use and lock in um, the race to the bottom on climate change and increase inequality, but actually deliver us on a different development pathway. And that means we need to change what's, what's here and abroad together. So, you know, rather than say, let's do development in a way that facilitates trade, which allows the UK to offshore its own emissions so that other countries can produce stuff which we can then import whilst we claim to be going on a net zero pathway, we need to transform everything. So rather than claiming as the local council I, I, I sit on that um, meeting the fair share climate budget um, within our area of the UK, they described as um, likely to be impossible in their climate delivery plan. Well, maybe we need to change the rules of the game slightly if, if, we, if we decide that it's likely to be impossible to meet climate finance 
uh, climate development targets within the UK, while at the same time using that same business as usual approach in how we invest around the world. Um, I, I would just close by quoting an emeritus professor, an eminent academic at the Institute of Development Studies, Robert Chambers, who, who championed the idea of participation in how we do development. You could say he was the forerunner for um, the idea of a climate citizens assembly. He said that the person with the pen has the power. And actually we should give the people whose lives we want to change the power of determining what we want to see as a future. And, and he started his academic life talking in the 1980s about rural livelihoods and putting, putting the last first, as he, he put it. And you could think of that in a very traditional aid context. You know, we, we need to provide help, we need to provide assistance. But then his 2002 book turned things around. He, that was titled, Whose Reality Counts? Putting the First Last. And I think it's, it's degrowth in the richest countries. It's transforming the economies of the rich countries and then the demands that puts on around the world that is needed to free up all countries around the world to choose their own development pathways that serve their own needs, rather than us effectively proffering money around the world in a way that almost is encouraging countries around the world to connect back to us in a way that serves our journey to zero carbon without re relying and enabling that to happen everywhere at the same time. So I think it's probably a perfect moment to hand over to Harold to hear a perspective from such a country as that. I think it is, and I'm just going to interject for one second, which is I did an event with Tortoise Media this morning uh, talking about um, uh, energy, and I used the, used the term, I was, guess I was thinking hashtag energy democracy, and the chair went, wow! Energy democracy, that's an amazing idea, um, which I thought was interesting just to level the reaction. But um, as uh, Jonathan said, um, you did kind of finish on with some positive ideas about how things might be different. So it wasn't all negative. But we're going to hear from Harold Mugosi, who's um, a Kenyan global young green delegate, delegate here at COP. Um, reaction to everything you've just heard. Over to you, Harold. Good evening. Uh, everyone is fine. Well, um, <laughs> the weather is very harsh for me. It's <laughs> extremely cold, and I've never been in such a cold weather. So I might look inactive or a little bit uh, <laughs> cold, but uh, really, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it is quite a privilege to be here today. And um, mine is really to give my perspective of what I think should happen in terms of reshaping the global South economies uh, to you know, deal with um, climate change. Because uh, it's indeed a scientific fact that um, the global South countries bear the greatest burden of the effects of climate change, while we have not benefited to the economic activities that have brought us to where we are in terms of the effects of climate change, all right? So um, coming to COP26, I didn't have a lot of expectation, but at least I knew that something is going on uh, in terms of climate change mitigation. And um, as a young economist, uh, very much interested in green economics, I look at it in terms of much more deliberate action needs to be taken in terms of financing you know, climate change mitigation uh, strategy and activities in, uh, you know, the global south. And uh, yesterday I met my good friend there and uh, he shared with me some very interesting, uh, you know, data from India where there have been shifting goalposts on the agreements on climate change since Rio, that's in 92, okay? You say we're going to do uh, two degrees and now it goes to 1.5 and nothing is done. We're going to finance 100 billion and that is not achieved. And you change it from uh, 2020, you take it to 2025. And so as a young person, I feel there is no deliberate action or intention to really mitigate climate change. And um, yesterday in uh, part of the conversation we were having at the Youth Hub was that the fossil fuel industry have become very cunning and um, they are changing things like 
you know, hydrogen that are produced, you know, using fossil fuel. Now they are terming them, you know, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen to confuse those who are really genuine about, uh, you know, climate change. So um, as a young economist, I believe that the worst effect of climate change on the global south is the increasing, in fact, at an exponential level, uh, the increasing gap in wealth and income disparity. The poor in the global south are becoming poorer. The rich, those who are invested in the fossil fuel industry are getting more rich. And if we don't act fast to reshape the economies within the global south, then we are going to leave majority of the people whom we want to help behind. Okay. I have hope that um, acting on climate mitigation would in all ways bring together not only the young people, but all generations who will come even after us so that no one is actually left behind. So I, I, I have a few things that I think if done rightly in reshaping our economies, then uh, we are likely to you know, move forward, uh, mitigate climate change, hit our targets, as uh, Jonathan has explained, uh, you know, as soon as possible. So um, it's important for uh, the markets to appreciate and, and really include the prices of the, or the cost of environmental and, uh, you know, the economic factors in, in the final end of products. And that can be done through things like carbon taxing, you introduce them so that you know everyone pays their fair share of um, you know damage they do to our our, 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 our planet. It's also important that um, we reimagine and reorganize our market um, on the lens of sustainable, uh, you know, in, in the lens of sustainable markets, such that um, we regulate uh, the use or the the the, the exploitation of natural and mineral resources, while we also, uh, you know, ensure that we get only that which is enough for today and uh, ensuring that the future generations have what they will need then. Number two, it's also important to invest in uh, real game-changing technologies uh, to ensure that we speed up, you know, the creation of sustainable economies and um, eliminate the, the barriers to, you know, to change to better lifestyle. Um, I'm very much impressed when I came here, I see electric buses that is not there in, in, in my country. You know, it's, it's, it's green everywhere. And um, I've seen a few electric cars on the streets. You know, those are good steps forward. We need the same effort to be put uh, in the global South countries. We are very much far behind. And so if we can take advantage of such technologies, of course, um, I, I, I want to commend my country, Kenya. Our government has invested a lot in uh, sustainable energy production. We have hydroelectric and also uh, solar and um, wind power, which are some of the things we need to ensure that we quickly go away from uh, fossil fuel and uh, mitigate climate change. It's also important, and this I think is vital, especially in the global south, to make it easier for the larger populations to differentiate products that are sustainable from the ones which are not sustainable. Okay, and uh, there was some program we were running back home. It's called the Green Academy, and one of the things that we were focusing on with the young people is that we want to domesticate the idea on climate change domesticate in the sense that we want the people to own it up we want it to simplify it so that you know when when, when you go to a village in in, in in kenya and you tell someone that you have not received rain this year because of climate change they clearly don't understand climate change okay but when you tell them that you cut the trees and that reduces the rainfall we get and that leads to uh you know uh we can't really predict our seasons anymore and plan, you know, as we want it. Then it's easier for them to relate and really know what is climate change. And that makes it possible for them to take action. And in that regard, if we explain to them that uh, 
this is an organic product. We have used organic farming here and it is good for you. And this is a product that has used chemicals that affect our climate, then they get to appreciate and you know, understand that. So as we think in that lens, then it's easier to have our economies, uh, for example, if it's the agribusiness, where many young people in Kenya are very much getting involved, then it's easy for them to embrace organic farming in the long term. So we create a small economy of organic farmers or young people who really, uh, you know, appreciate the fact that organic farming is good for our, uh, you know, our, our, our planet. Uh, it's also important to reskill our workers, who especially those who have been in the fossil fuel industries, you know, so that as we move towards a sustainable um, systems or sustainable ways of doing things, then they are not left behind, all right? Because you know that uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, for the young people in the global south is unemployment. And it's even going to get worse when we talk of shift to sustainable uh, economy, and yet the skills they have are what the ones for, you know, the, 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 the unsustainable, you know, economies. And so um, other speakers before me have talked about um, financing. And uh, it's important that uh, we truly make the financing favorable to the global south. I very much uh, am against the loans and because that is you know, continuing to cripple the, um, the economies in the global south. And so if we are able to genuinely and in fact increase the funding so that more of it is given in form of grants rather than concession loans and, 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 and all that, that brings a lot of you know, other effects. You know, there's, there, there, in my country right now, we have um, the World Bank, is that right? Yes, yeah. the World Bank uh, initiated, uh, you know, mandatory um, uh, readjustments, you know, structural readjustments uh, policies, you know, that have really affected young people. In fact, one of the biggest things is the increase in the university fees, which has made it very difficult for young people to access the education that they need. So if we change the system of climate financing, it means that in the future, we will not have to bear the structural adjustments which are being forced on, on you know, the young people and, and you know, on the economies, the global south. So um, there's need for more aggressive climate financing. Uh, you know, big numbers have been thrown here, 300 billion and trillions. I think there is need for more research in the actual effects of climate change on the local person. And then we calculate that per person and then look at the overall population. Because if we say 100 billion, then I'm sure that is not even going to help an inch on you know, mitigating climate change and improving lives. And so at the end of the day, as we do all this, um, we, as the frontiers of uh, climate change mitigation, must come up with uh, proper commitments and also concrete and ambitious plans to ensure that we save our planet within uh, the time that we're able to save it. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that contribution. And I think that focus on young people is something I've certainly been thinking about a lot at COP. And we have so many problems the world is facing. And we actually are seeing birth rates are actually going down, child per woman are going down very fast. We have to make sure we use all of the human resources on this planet, allow people to develop and flourish and educate themselves and then have a chance to use those skills to tackle all the problems that we've got. So, okay, so we've now got some time for Q&A. Um, I know it's, it's a little bit difficult when you've been sitting there for a while and just listening. It's a bit of a change in mood to leap forward and stick your hand up. So there's a special gold star, virtual gold star for the first person who uh, feels brave and asks a question. So, all right, the uh, over here is the black mask on the right. Thank you. I was interested in the mention of you mentioned finance, which I was also taking is Howard. Yeah, Howard mentioned as reskilling. Harold. Harold. Yeah. Harold. Yeah. Yep. Harold yeah. 
uh, reskilling. And, I, and, and that, that, to me, I, I just join the two together in my head. And um, what I see that the, the, the word I have in here mentioned is engineering uh, and or manufacturing. And to me, what what I see is you've got the money, uh, but what do you do with it? And to me, there's uh, there's a, there's a, uh, getting away from the fossil fuel industries, the, 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 the reduction in, in the dependency, reskilling the people to provide the equipment that we need for uh, sustainability and for um, the, the sort of the, the solar power and uh, wind power. The fact of uh, what I'm trying to think is that I don't want people transporting really windmills around the world. I want them made where they're going to be planted. And I think that's that's an important aspect of, to me of, of, the, of the solution, what we're looking for. Okay, what we might do is take a, a small number of questions if we can from the floor, if anyone else from the floor has any questions. You know, if this is forcing you to get active, get involved, get engaged. Uh, well, not forcing you, of course, we're Greens, but yes, they're in the black mask, thank you. Um, Hi, Maria Smith. How do you read about you? Hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was really interested in um, what Jonathan Young was saying about the, the narratives as well. And I was just, thought that most of this is like only relevant to this conversation. But I'm just thinking about the way that we frame this as a climate emergency. And we're really focused on the climate emergency. And we're talking about carbon, 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 carbon. Um, but obviously, a, a lot of what um, We'll be talking about how, especially this is this is a social emergency. This is a, a, a question of exploitation and domination, and, and, and I'm just wondering if everybody, if we could reframe this instead of calling it a climate emergency, call it something else. What would we call it, and how might that help? Very interesting question. Uh, we got one more question from the floor. Anyone else feeling brave? Send at the front here. Thank you. So my name is Emma Astrom. I'm from the Green Party in Sweden. But I wonder, uh, you have lots of good examples in Kenya about agroforestry, and you have the wheat tree planting project in um, Bagai Matai. And uh, then you don't use pesticides and so on, but then you have the other organization that you want to have the farmers using pesticides and fertilizer, and then the farmer goes on the other way. So I've been there, and I think it's a good example. So, uh, and that is a way of also the knowledge of all the seeds there are. And there is a story uh, in the book that told me about we eat trees because you have very good, species trees. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think there's three really good questions there. We're probably going to have time for one more round of questions. So people who haven't asked the question yet, you can be thinking about that while I give each one of the speakers in turn a chance to respond to those three questions, which were about engineering and manufacturing, about narratives about our human emergency, our poverty emergency perhaps, um, and the place of agroforestry and organics. So perhaps we'll go the other way around. Harold, if you'd like to start. Um, Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, if you allow me, in, in you know back at home, I'll say you're my elder, and, and thank you, <laughs> thank you for your good question. And uh, it was more of a comment, I think so, not really a question, right? Yes, I agree with you that uh, you know when we come here from the global south, I think my interest should be what am I taking back home, or how is this conversation going to affect? my locality, because for a long time, we have felt that the climate change conversation is so elitist, okay? It's so up there. And so the point of my agenda, I'm here with the Salome, who will come with from the same country, same organization, is to domesticate this idea or this concept to the lowest level. So if I talk about agriculture, my country is about 48%, GDP is about agriculture. And so I would say we want to educate our people to motivate them, to encourage them, to inspire them to do organic farming. That will move us forward as a country to mitigating climate change. And that can be done with or without funding because we do agriculture, okay? And, and so if there are going to be some support that is coming, then that needs to be focused on agriculture where a majority of people are. 
you know, if it's about industry, you know, about the pesticides, then can we now have ways of producing in large scale organic manure? That's number one. And I believe that really answers the question. And also the other things like, you know, if, if it's um, energy production, solar production, I think right now we have a quite upcoming um, industry on solar. Many more people in Kenya are going the solar way as an alternative to, um, you know, to energy solutions for their homes. Another reason why that is going on is the price of electricity in my country is so high, the one from the government. So many people want to produce their own, you know, you know, because we have light, we have sunlight throughout the year, we are the equator, you see that? Yeah. Number two, uh, my sister there asked that uh, if, if we don't call it climate emergency, what else would we call it? I think that the greatest challenge facing humanity today is climate. And uh, I think we can't run away from that fact. We have to face it bold enough. What we need to do is just to change our message so that many people feel that this is part of our lives daily. Okay? You see, in majority of Africa, people know that, uh, you know, things like weather are God-given. We pray to God for rain to come. We make sacrifices, we slaughter bulls, and maybe you go to our sorcerers and all that. But with science, we tend to understand now that it is our activities that actually control the weather. And so we have in our hands the power to change or to make the weather better or favorable for things we want to do. So I think that there is no other better thing, better term. It's just climate. But now we need to make people understand that it is how you live that is social, how you spend your money, economics, and how you think about it, intellectual, psychological, that really affects how we live. And finally, uh, my mom here, I, 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 if you allow me to call you that. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Out of respect, we, we, that, that's fine. We do a lot of tree planting. And um, one of the things that um, as young people we tend to encourage is can we, we try to educate young people to know how to calculate their carbon footprint, okay? <laughs> so that you don't plant 10 trees and claim that you're fighting, fighting climate change, all right? For example, myself, my carbon foot, footprint requires that I plant about 763 trees. I ensure that I do at least 2,000 annually, okay? And I've engaged my father, who is about uh, 58 right now, to also do the same, okay? So I agree with you, a lot of work is going on it's in the business sector. Uh, young people are getting more involved. The older generations are learning from the young people. And uh, with time, we know that we will reach, uh, you know, as a country, the NDC for Kenya includes having a 10% minimum forest coverage. So we are really working mm -hmm. to achieve that. Thank you. And then this project that we have from Sweden okay. in Palma Center in Italia, uh, and they collect seeds, but they have a gender aspect because the, the seeds must come from women and they pay for women because they take care uh, much better of the, of the economic. So uh, that's also a point of view. Yeah. And uh, then uh, it's a good example in Tidale of the retreat planting trees. And they all want to build around the benefit of them. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Jonathan Essex, if you want to come back on any of, or all of those three questions. Okay. I'm going to skip the trees because um, I think the trees have been well covered. Um, in terms of the focus on finance and engineering and skills, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would pitch that quite often we're focusing on on climate finance, on, on official development assistance to provide infrastructure, to provide capital, to provide development. What we need to do is to shift maybe towards livelihoods and jobs. And to do that, we, we need more skills. So I think we should, we should model ourselves maybe as Britain, we should follow Cuba's lead as, a, as an international donor. Because what they've done is they've developed their health service to such an extent that rather than the UK where we recruit doctors and nurses from other countries, to come here because we have a shortage which deprives other countries of, of the skills they need. Um, Cuba exports doctors. 
and that's how they do development. So, so what if we develop the expertise in the UK, the skills to export the, the climate vision that, that is deliverable in all, all countries? Um, and, and I think that would change the way development happens. So recently I was involved in a project in Rwanda. It was about a vision for urban planning for secondary cities. And, and what we found is the World Bank mission went in and the World Bank mission will go in and they'll say, right, they'd written their mission report before they arrived, by the way. Um, but basically it said, we need to spend X percent on each town tarmacking roads to make uh, the roads uh, bonded rather than, than gravel. And that's the starting point. Now that sucks up all X amount of money. But if you say, OK, well, let's have this idea called low traffic neighbourhoods. It's become a bit more popular in the UK since then. Um, for, uh, and so we only need to pave the roads where the, the buses go and where the, the freight transport goes. Then all the money you free up from just building roads, you can spend on decarbonising the energy system. You can, you can spend on creating the, the, the ability of, of industries to create um, more traditional building materials from, from Adobe, from um, sustainable sourced things in the region. And, and, and this is really good for Rwanda. Rwanda is a landlocked country that relies on import of fossil fuels a long distance to get there. So what if, what if that country was able to be more resilient because it used the resources it has? And, and therefore, with allowing a development in a different way. Uh, I think Rwanda have just bought four solar powered airships, which means that they can move materials around the country without building a road, without investing in lorries, without having runways, without having airports, and just lift and drop. And okay, that might mean you constrain the total amount of materials you move around from the start, but maybe that's leapfrogging the mistakes we've made and getting back to the scale of consumption, which is in fitting with, with climate limits. And I think that points me towards narratives. And I would say we need narratives, not so much for climate change, but narratives for the economy, because I think it's the economy ultimately that we need to change. And I, and, and I don't know if it's fair or unfair to brand the current global economy as exploitative, one that expels people from the place where they live and separates home and life and family and friends from each other. And it's, and it's extractive. It's unsustainable. So what if the economy was about inclusion and integrity and empowerment? And what if then the way we did aid will be about contributing to, to other people's uh, development, uh, which is a move, move away from aid, but also about collaboration. And, and, and in, the, in the work that we've done, the, the, the recent study on greenhouse, we, we've focused on, uh, I think it's called Euroclima Plus, which is uh, a process where um, collaboration to help develop and strengthen the plans for climate change across Latin America, across 18 countries. But what if rather than doing it in such a way that here's Europe going to, to help and strengthen X, Y, Z countries to produce their plans, we said, well, why don't we open it up and make it both ways? Why don't we say, well, why don't, why don't you come from Kenya to help strengthen our plan here at the same time? You might have a few things to tell us. And, and we made it both ways. So we don't expect the contributions just to flow from the so-called rich or developed countries, but we expect and acknowledge that everyone's got contributions to bring to the table. And to solve the climate crisis, we've got to take on the lessons, the understanding that, that rests with all of us, and we've got to work together. So, so maybe if we developed our plans to collectively, we would be in a position to say, this is what we collectively need to be done. And then maybe we could answer collectively Howard's question of how much money we actually need. Okay. And then maybe we could collectively provide that money. Okay, I'm, yeah, okay. I'm very aware, Jonathan Gwenny, that not being in the room, it's much more difficult. Right. But I do want to create some space for you to both answer, respond to any of those three questions that you want to, or also anything else that you've heard. So if I get over to you, Jonathan Gwenny. Thank, thanks so much. Great question. Just on that last point, I was... Uh, Having a chat with Salim Mohuka, sorry to drop his name again, but he actually gave this example of how he said, that, you know, the floods in Germany, people died in the floods in Germany. He said no one would have died in Bangladesh because we have got our shit together. Sorry, I'm really blue today. Uh, but we actually know how to deal with floods and we need to send people to Germany to teach them. And you know, this is one of the fundamental kind of changes, not only in narrative, but in practice that we need in the whole international cooperation system. There is a deep, we all know this, a deep, deep arrogance in the global north that says self-claims developed status. In other words, we have no more developing to do. We are past participle developed. It's just deeply arrogant. Actually, the word developing is, is I'm quite relaxed about. I think we're all developing, that's fine. We're all progressing, we're all on a process. 
But the idea that some countries have now developed is just it's just one example of the deep arrogance of the international uh, of the of the of the northern countries in, in in international cooperation. And yeah, it's one aspect, as Jonathan has said, of the of the of the changes in narrative that are required. I really appreciated Harold's. Um, and, and everyone really bringing in the non-climate aspects in this. I mean, I came to this meeting, to, to, you know, trying to talk about climate finance, which is not really my area, but absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I, I actually think there shouldn't be climate finance. Um, I think that's probably now a mistake. Um, it, it is at the heart of the additionality problem. If you have something called climate finance and something called, I don't know, development finance and something called humanitarian finance, it, additionality is a chimera, a total chimera, and so it proved. We need to talk about global public investment, and that's actually my job, and you can look at my website, globalinvestment.org, and that's what we're trying to work on. We need to bring it together, and absolutely we need to respond to the inequality crisis, to the social protection crisis, to the health crisis. I mean, oh my God, we still haven't really mentioned COVID, but it's changed the game, and it's going to change the game for climate as well. Because as I say, uh, there is a profound anger in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, about the way that COVID has been handled. It's 2021 and presidents were flying north again, as they used to in the seventies, to beg for money. Not just for, to beg for vaccines, but to beg for money. And like, people are like, this is crazy. And it's, it's, it has to happen now because, you know, it's desperate measures. But I think there is clarity in much uh, of the Southern, of the leadership in Southern countries at the moment, that this is not gonna happen again. There is no way that come a crisis of this nature in 2026, 20, 2031, we're going to be flying north again to beg for money for vaccines, for all that stuff. We're going to, we need to change the structures now. And I think that this is the kind of, you know, and I, I'm not a big kind of, the moment is now, I'm not going to try and kind of persuade you that somehow, I'm not, it's not for campaigning reasons that I'm saying this, but genuinely for analytical reasons, I feel that the moment is now. I think we are facing big problems, quite obviously, in terms of leadership, um, in, in, especially in Europe and in, U and in the US and the kind of US-China thing. And there's all sorts of problems. But at the same time, this crisis has created an opportunity for the kind of structural change that people have been pushing for for many years. And in a sense, if we don't take advantage of this crisis slash opportunity now, then in a couple of years, it's going to possibly have died down again. I mean, we know the climate's going to you know, keep on getting worse, but the COVID stuff's going to die down. So we need to, we need to um, take advantage of, of this opportunity. It's fascinating to hear again, Harold say, you know, the World Bank is back doing its kind of structural adjustment business. For, for the first two decades of this century, the bank has been quietened because countries like Kenya, I think you said you're from Kenya, Harold, countries like Kenya would be doing much better. Yeah, so when a country is doing much better, it basically says, thanks, thanks, World Bank, for your opinion. I've got plenty of other options. But in this economic crisis brought on by COVID, the bank is using, literally using, health and economic crisis to impose, once again, the kind of policies that we know are so limited at best and damaging at worst. And so absolutely, we need to bring this together. We, we, we use the term investment to answer the lady's question about um, narrative. And I, I'm, you know, whenever I try to come up with campaigning slogans, I'm told very swiftly by campaigners to get back into my box. And I'm not the person to, want to, to know how to get, you know, politicians and, and the public going. But I think in some context, the, the language of investment in our common world is powerful. And I think in other contexts, the language of global justice vaccine justice, climate justice, reparations is incredibly powerful. So, so actually, you know, there are different constituencies that we have to, to move. Um, but, but yeah, like I, like I was saying, the, the, I think the moment is now. I think we have to change our narrative. And I think we have to focus not just on quantities of money, but on governance of that money. Because if all the money, and we talk loads of talk about new funds, climate funds, health funds, whatever it is funds, if they end up being managed just by the bank, where, where you know, as we know, and we've known for decades, the US has a veto share, you know, that's not going to be money that's going to be well spent. So we need some kind of structural change whereby the countries themselves have much more decision making and, 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 and oversight of the money that they themselves need to spend. 
Um, I, I, I feel kind of um, excited that that we could emerge with something good because because I think there is momentum in the global south. But I'm also dampened down in my excitement because I think the global north is entering, has already entered a moment of deep conservatism and defensiveness um, as the economy struggles. So I'm worried about that. Um, who knows how it will work out, but we need to campaign harder and harder, that's for sure. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Well, we're just about out of time, but I do just want if anyone in the room wants to make a short contribution or a yes. question. Yes, I can feel there was some energy. Okay, I can see two in the front row. Um, pick top first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mark, the dollar will possibly the stock off. Yeah, so much energy. I totally agree, but you are green, so it's not so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, my question is, uh, I used to talk about seven generation to build the economy, to rebuild the economy, uh, economy that is good in seven generation. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I totally agree to uh, not continue on the old structures. They, ha they have been good, but now they aren't for the future. So we, we can't rebuild and put any more money in the structure, structure we have today. The economic thinking should be from the indigenous people in the, in the pretty north in Sweden, from the Sami people or anything from the indigenous people from the globe to think and plan for seven generation. Is that something you use when you argue in economic uh, issues. Okay, uh, second question from Blue Mask. Yep. <laughs> I want to talk about inclusivity. We're talking about it has to be both ways. It has to come from the global south and, and, every, and the developed countries. I believe investing in the next generation is what we should focus on because uh, we need this thing to be successive. You know, after uh, this generation, our future generations continue, continue what we are doing from this meeting. So I believe it's important to invest. You know, we have projects, uh, we, we're planning to have projects in, in Kenya, whereby we go to schools, young kids, people in secondary and university, educate them on the importance of, of, uh, of uh, taking care of or conserving our environment, because we need this thing to be continuous. You know, we need this this generation, yeah, generation. generation to another. So I believe it's important that we take climate change, we take the environment as a personal issue. That I have a contribution towards the towards towards the environment, and you have. So together, we are able to solve it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm just very taken by my first sort of 24 hours in COP was very focused on youth. And you know, I think what we also have to do is not just talk about education and skills and that, but a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old now is an expert in being a 10, 15 or 18-year-old now. And we have to actually listen to them. And you know, the average age of a delegate in COP is over 60. And very often people wheel out the one youth person on the, on the panel. And, you know, let, let's have much more fully used panels. I can see one more pressing question there. I'm just going to squeeze this in very quickly. Um, hi. It's just, I work with young people. Um, and it's really nice to hear from Harold um, about the, the young people that you're talking about and how there's lots of sustainability is always there and lots of variety of things that they're doing in their life. I find here, and when we're talking about exchanging of ideas, um, you know, from the north and the south, I find a lot of, in our society, somebody can think very sustainably in one part of their life, and then they can almost switch that off in another part of their life. Um, and I see a lot of that here, somebody who might be a strong campaigner or anything like that, and they do it subconsciously, and is it the economy that makes them do that? Is it like, do we need to say, is it that you can have aspirations in one area and then to be different in another area? So I think, you certainly, that I work with quite a lot, learn so much from the way that you seem to be really, you know, the same, the senior past. 
which, which seems like a perfect point in which um, on my list of things to do here as chair is Peter is going to perhaps very briefly uh, present uh, the zero carbon policy toolkit overview. So this is a kit of tools to, I guess, apply for everything. So that fits in with that holistic point. Yes, so I'll very briefly, there's more information available than the stool offers, but this is the toolkit of interventions in our economy that where Greenhouse and the Green New Human Foundation are proposing as an output of this project um, to tackle with many, of, to address many of the issues raised today. So I'll just briefly flick through. So um, it's assessing interventions uh, to, uh, to, to get to zero carbon, and that includes taking the social and the environmental um, constraints together, so taking that human side with the climate side, um, and it, so it considers these multiple considerations side by side, um, and trying to address the root causes of these issues, and this, you know, because often the social issues and the climate issues have the same root causes. Um, so this is the toolkit, it's, this is a very brief overview, um, I'll just show you we've created this infographic which is available on our store as a flyer um, and this in, uh, so it includes you know this, this objective of how to reshape the economy and it includes enablers so things that we need to start doing in order to get to zero carbon and it includes blockers so things we need to stop doing and it's uh, organized into three families so transforming business as usual which are the things we absolutely have to change uh, uh, things the government must change, so there's different interventions for different parts of the economy, and things that we as our underlying society need to change. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I've spoken about some of this already, but I thought I'll just pick, quickly pick on this point on complexity, because it is complicated, but it's not so complicated we can't understand it. We have to get away from that point that was made earlier that, oh, it's complicated, and therefore it's not for us, it's for else. There is some complexity, but it's, it's we can break it down into blocks and understand it, and that is a tool to enable us to uh, approach the solution. So, flyer, booklet, available on the stool, find out more. Thank you. Well, well done, Peter. That was a very quick run through. Now, what I'm going to do to allow us to finish off is each one of the speakers, 30 seconds or so, not more than that, because we'll get thrown out soon. One takeaway message, what's the one thing that you would like people to, to walk away remembering from this? So, perhaps, Harold, if we can start with you. Oh, that, that's interesting because there's a lot of information here. Uh, but I think the most important thing is to approach climate change mitigation as a social agenda. We are improving lives. Okay? So as we work on climate change, as we source for finance, as we work on the science and technique behind climate change mitigation, our focus should be we are improving lives of the people. And that is the key word that I can come up with. I, I, I love it. <laughs> so I, I was just thinking about the, the seven generations, and I think we need to move away from economics. Sustainability means the ability to sustain. That's basically what it means. Joanna Macy will call that active hope, which is hope through what we do, but we don't know the answers. We don't know what's going to be here in seven generations time. So I think we need to have the honesty and humility to do what's being described as transformational adaptation, to say that these aren't technical things. We need to set ourselves on a pathway today, knowing that we may make the wrong choices. So we need to allow the future generations to deconstruct, to repair, to improve, to flexibly change the mistakes we make now on the journey and still be able to get to where they need to go. So that's my hope. Okay, Jonathan Gwedi. It's, it's, a, it's a historic moment, be radical. Don't let people censor your big ideas. We can't win if we're not honest and ambitious. Short and to the point and very clear. And I'm just going to finish from the chair with a, with a little thought experiment, which is imagine that we'd actually created this most wonderful world in which everyone had a secure life, food, housing, a job if you wanted it, a role in life. Everything was as, you know, as close to utopia as you could possibly imagine. And then you discovered there's a climate emergency and we're going to have to change everything. That would be really politically difficult. 
Whereas we know that we haven't created a world that works for people. We've had an economy where people have been working for the economy. We need to turn it round and have an economy that works for people. Uh, and you know, we are at this moment. It's absolutely clear that we're in a moment of massive monumental change. The future doesn't look like the past. And that's really good news because we have the chance to build something better. So thank you very much to our three speakers, particularly thank you to Jonathan Glennie for sticking with us through a screen, which is always a bit of a challenge. Um, thank you very much to Greenhouse and the Green European Foundation for organising this. To a wonderful audience with some great contributions. Now, there was a suggestion that maybe we should adjourn this somewhere to somewhere where, the, where it's possible to get a drink. I don't know if we have any locals who can offer any recommendations, because um, I'm certainly up here on the panel. We don't oh, you're making any. me so jealous now, Natalie. <laughs> It's so unfair. Uh, so, all right, we'll talk about that later. We'll wrap up now and say thank you very, very much, everyone, for a great event. Thanks very much.